Hello and welcome to History Rage, the new podcast where we invite members of the historical community to get angry, to get a few things off their chest. My name is Paul Babel and I'm here with my good friend and co-host Kyle Glover. Hello. And this week's guest is a fellow podcaster, our first fellow podcaster. This week we welcome Dean Strachan from the Chronicler podcast. Hello Dean and welcome to the show. Hello, Paul, and uh, thank you for having me on the show. Um, yeah, you're more the, than welcome. Yeah, uh, so the pro- the Chronicle podcast is about Chinese history, and the reason why I've chosen Chinese history is because I actually live here in Beijing. When I came here three years ago, I started to study Chinese history, and I really got into it, and I thought, hey, why not start a podcast about it? So here I am. Sounds good. Well, here you are, and nice to have you here as well. So I gather today that you've you've not actually come to talk about your usual area of specific interest, Chinese history. You've really come to talk something more in line with, well, with your original homeland that your accent somewhat gives away. So, <laughs> Dean, please, the main history rage question is just what is the one thing that you wish people would just stop believing? <sighs> I would love for people to stop believing that Braveheart is a true story about William Wallace. Oh, you and are so <laughs> preaching to the choir here now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the the whole film, um, I think there's only a couple of things that are maybe accurate in the film. I mean, the guy was called William Wallace. They got the name right at least. But I mean good start. apart from that, it's just Yeah, I mean it's a good start, but apart from that, like there's so many blatant mistruths about it and there's so many blatant what's the word I'm, i can't even get the words out i'm not angry <laughs> um so yeah it's just it's really annoying because um when people talk to me about braveheart and you know william wallace they always go to the movie and i'm like come on that 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 didn't happen like you don't know what you're talking about just shut up so like yeah it gets really on my nerves when people you know, try to talk about Braveheart as if it's like historical fact. And I mean, don't get me wrong, when historians talk about Braveheart, they know it's like all fiction. But it's just like, you know, the regular people who haven't really studied history or anything and they just watch the movie. And don't get me wrong, the movie is entertaining. Like, it is a good movie. But um, apart from that, it's just, yeah, it just gets on my nerves when people seem to think that it's factual or like some of it's factual when... The truth is, a lot of it is fictional. The vast majority, anyway. You're right. I'm with you there. It's a, it, it is a cracking movie. I, I know I run the risk of being run out of town by the historian community <laughs> by saying so. Um, Kyle, please forgive me. Um, but uh, it, it is a cracking movie, but one that I'm... At, I own it, but I'm not actually allowed to watch it on the basis that I rant too much all the way through it. <laughs> um, so, so absolutely with you on there. And uh, as we were kind of putting the pre-notes together in this like we, we discovered something that um that i didn't know previously about braveheart which is that uh, kyle doesn't really know a great deal about william wallace do you <laughs> ha, ha, yeah we may have stumbled across the one part of history i don't actually know all that much about and you know about two thousand year old cheese well four thousand please on, okay <laughs> Shame <laughs> on, your cheese is just too modern um well well, well, let's let's take something uh, take something from that then, and uh, no doubt we've both got quite a few questions to ask. So I'm going to start off really with: so what can the actual historical evidence, rather than Hollywood, tell us about William Wallace, the man, the event? Well, actually, surprisingly, like there isn't a lot of actual primary sources that can tell us about William Wallace, just because it was so long ago and a lot of the records were destroyed. So the only primary sources that I could really find was uh, the Lubeck letter, which was sent by Wallace and Andrew de Morey in 1297, as well as uh, the Wallace letter. And that is where William Wallace uh, visited the King of France and the King of France then sent a letter recommending Wallace to the Pope at the time. But I mean, apart from that, the only sources that we do have like come later on and it's like all poems about the deeds of wallace rather than you know like actual evidence of wallace the man the person kind of thing yeah so po- poetry not paperwork yes so the there's a po- there's a poem name uh, that was written by blind harry 
which is a not like is a famous example of like the exploits of Wallace, and it's just called Wallace or the Wallace. So there's a, there's a lot out there that doesn't exist. I mean, in terms of historical evidence, what what is there that that actually we do know that that we can demonstrate? Yeah, well, the things that we do know, of course, is the battles that took place. Like we definitely know they happened. <laughs> As well as that, the um, like the letters that Wallace sent, there are some there, and we do know that Wallace became the guardian of Scotland because his seal on those letters said he was the guardian of Scotland, even if it was only for one year. So there is evidence to talk about Wallace, but the problem is there isn't enough. So this is where you then get legend building from all these people later on, like all these um, historians that come along later on. They try to make Wallace like this great hero and you know like this is where the legend comes in pretty much uh, so in terms of really you know the, the great hero uh, was he wasn't he what's <laughs> it's, going on here it's hard to say because well the the one thing that you know the movie got right in terms of like Braveheart is that Wallace didn't surrender or like he never swore fealty to Edward, whereas all the other Scottish nobles actually did. So this is where like the heroism comes into it, where um, Wallace was like seen this as this guy who would never bend the knee to the English. And then this is where it all comes from. And as well as that, when he was the guardian of Scotland, he did try to like make some changes and reforms like to you know help Scotland when they were fighting the English and things. So there is like this almost like champion of the people that the reputation that he gets like there is that element of it in there uh, but it's just um there are other sides to Wallace's ca- character I mean like with everyone in history every great man in history there's always like a dark side to them and Wallace certainly had a dark side to say the least can you give us some examples yes, do, do, do yeah sure yeah well okay uh, so for example when he defeated an English sheriff rather than you know just like killing the guy and that was it he did skin him and then used his skin as a belt so that's like one example. Classy. I know. I mean, like he's trying. Yeah. He's like he's trying to, uh, you know, make up his own fashion with human skin. So fair play to him. Yeah, and this is actually uh, bizarrely, this is the second, you know, external use for skin that we've had on History of Age. <laughs> Our uh, episode one was talking about book binding and uh, and William Burke, but um, but yeah, the movie kind of like paints him as privately educated, can speak multiple languages. You know, comes back into comes back in on a horse, being able to speak four languages, mm. um, having been off to some of the finest educations in Europe, and then comes back to become a croft farmer. Mm. Is there any, any any part of that that's that's actually, you know, right? Yes, the education is correct, but I mean, like he didn't travel through Europe to get educated; he stayed in Scotland and. Actually, as the legend goes, he was educated in my hometown of Dundee. But he, uh, by all accounts, he could speak Gaelic, English, Latin, and French. Like, he got educated in all those languages. He could read and write them. And this kind of rebelling against the English, it didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't. You know, what's, what, what's his early attitudes towards the English? Well, this is the thing. Like, the movie does make it as if, like, you know... Uh, Wallace is just a commoner, uh, but that's actually not true. Wallace uh, came from, like, it was, he wasn't like high within the nobility, but he was a noble. His father, well, there's like two stories between who his father was. The first story and like the most like common knowledge or like the one that most people go to as being fact is a noble called Sir Malcolm Wallace of Eldersley. And there's another medieval document that says that his uh, father was a man named Alan Wallace from Ayrshire. But, you know, the thing is, he did come from some wealth. So, like, the farm boy story, that's a load of shit. That didn't happen. He was actually, you know, he was actually a noble, albeit low down within the nobility. But, yeah, like, he, he was educated and he did stay in Scotland. But when it came to the English and, like, the rule of the English... The Wallace clan were not happy with English rule. And the reason why is because they were in the southern belt of Scotland. So they were like the closest yeah. ones to England. So of course they're not happy. And like this this part of the story where Wallace, uh, like Wallace's father, like what sorry, Wallace's father dies when he's young, that's pretty much true. Like he did like his his father died when he was a teenager. So the movie almost got that right. 
and he was fighting the English when his father and older brother did die. So the movie got that bit right. But yeah, so so the idea that we've got that the the, the English just appear, they they kill his wife, they uh, and he goes on a he goes on a rampage. That's that's just not on. There's yeah. a whole load more politics going on there. Yeah, so it's it's like the thing is like uh, Madam, like the 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 wife of William Wallace in the movie. That's all fiction. Like, there's no record of a woman called Miriam in William's life. There's no wife either. Like, there's no record of that ever happening. So, as far as we're aware, that's a load of rubbish. <laughs> but, like, the rebel- the sense of rebellion came from, like, his clan. And, like, you know, his father and brother were killed by the English when he was young. So, there is that personal motive behind Wallace rebelling. And it's probably why he never bent the knee to Edward in the first place, like because his father and brother were killed by the English. Mm-hmm. One of the film things that, whilst we're speaking about King Edward I of England, one thing Braveheart quite neatly sidesteps is why he's in Scotland at all. Why is he claiming to be King of Scotland and yeah. sending all these English soldiers to occupy the country? What's the actual history behind mm. that kind of thing? I know that's a big subject yeah, to cover, so... but. Um, Please, try, try your best. Yeah, I'll try. Yeah, I'll try in as like few words as possible. Okay. <laughs> um, but like, uh, <laughs> but like, um, when it came to like Edward being in Scotland in the first place, I mean, if you look at the situation that Edward the First found himself in, like it's almost like he's fighting a war on two fronts because he's laying claims to France, and of course he's got a troublesome neighbor to the north, which is Scotland. And what happens in Scotland is that. The Scottish king at the time, Alexander III, he died when he was travelling in the year 1286. And, like, you know, kings die all the time. That's no problem. But it is a problem when they don't have a son. So, of course, a succession... Yeah, common problem England's had as well. Yeah, yeah. So, like, after that, there was a succession crisis and the Scottish nobles turned to their neighbour, the King of England, to name a successor. Now, of course, foolish move. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know what they were thinking. Like, they should have went to France. Like, if you're going to be honest, <laughs> like, go to France. It is Scotland's traditional ally, you know. Exactly. Why, why turn to the English? I have no idea. I don't know why they did that. Like, I could not find out why they did it. But maybe it's because, like, geography, they were closer. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's something to do with that. So, yeah, then, then, of course, Edward sees an opportunity in this and he chooses John Balliol, like um, a noble, to be the successor. But then, as soon as Balliol is crowned king, he then has to swear fealty to Edward. And then, of course, Edward, by default, becomes the overlord of Scotland. And what's amazing about this is that, you know, there wasn't this outrage straight away. Because this happened in, like, 1286. And there wasn't any sign of rebellion until 10 years later, in 1295. So, like, the, the, no, the nobles in Scotland, they kind of grumbled about it, but they didn't really do anything about it either. Looking at the the, the kind of big set pieces of the movie is uh, are the battles. Mm. You know, I think, I think pretty much everybody can just move aside from the clothing. We can just <laughs> park that and know that that's horrifically wrong. <laughs> yes. But, you know, people will look at the Battle of Stirling Bridge and the Battle of Falkirk, which are quite defining parts of Scottish history. Mm. I believe I uh, am. I am I wrong? They were done completely the opposite way around as well. They've got their, you know, their tactics and everything. And don't get me started on there was an actual bridge involved. I, I was just yes. going to say I know um, nothing but, about, uh, but yeah, nothing about William Wallace, but I do know there was a bridge at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. That's fairly central to the battle. Hence the name. That is the sum total of my knowledge. Please do carry on. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, the the battles. Oh, the battles. Go yeah, for go, it. Go, uh, go, go. So the battles. The battles are the, the the most annoying part about the movie because, like, you know, it may, like the clothing for a start, like, come on, like it's, it looks like a bunch of savages fighting an organized army and winning, which would never have happened in the first place. <laughs> so um, the battles, like the oh, the best way, like you know, like they, oh, I don't even know what to say. So like, <laughs> <laughs> this is what we like a speechless history, Rachel. Yeah. That, that that angry. <laughs> yeah. So like um. So yeah, the armor, that's like like it's almost like disgraceful, like the way that they depicted the Scots in that way, just because like that never happened at all. The, the Scots wore armor. Like we did wear armor. It's a medieval battlefield. Of course there was armor involved. And like, you know, the Scots look disorganized when they're up against the English and you know, 
there's that iconic part of the movie where there's the cavalry charge and like Wallace is shouting hold hold and then like they get the pikes up at the last minute and they're like oh it's all fiction that did not happen um of course because like there wasn't a bridge so how would you like you can't even have a cavalry charge across a bridge well it wouldn't be very practical so um yeah like the the battle itself like the real battle that happened yeah talk us through the real battle of sterling bridge because like you say it's not a bunch of savages that beat a well-organized army it's a very intelligent tactical preparation. Yeah. Uh, the, and tell us about that. Yeah, okay. So um, the battle itself, like the real battle, um, the English, like, you know, they come up and uh, they face the Scots and Stirling and something that I've not put in my notes, but I do know just from reading previously, uh, the English commander was actually ill when he arrived in Stirling. So like the English were just standing around at the south side of the bridge for like two days, like not doing anything which gave the Scots plenty of time to organize themselves. And what happened was when the English did finally, you know, like try to cross the bridge, Wallace did tell his men to hold. <laughs> but what he was doing was he was like basically bottleneck, like he was using this bottleneck tactic where like all the English soldiers, they're all forced into this position where they're all tightly packed. And it then became a killing zone. And that's exactly what happened. So as the English are crossing the bridge, because like it's a narrow bridge, it's only two men per like two men apiece to actually cross the bridge. The Scots were just waiting there, holding holding like their positions, and they were waiting in a nearby forest out of sight of the English. And then of course, as like half of the English army does cross the bridge, that's when the Scots unleash themselves and you know basically get stuck into them. And the English seeing what's happening in front of them, you know, like they can't run away because the rest of the army is like coming towards them, like from the opposite side of the bridge. Uh, they all try to like jump in the river, but they're all bogged down by their armor and then they end up drowning. And like, it was like a total victory for the Scots. Like, I mean, when you think of the odds, it was like two to one, like they were outnumbered and Wallace used this genius tactic in order to like defeat the English. And yeah, it was, um, a total yeah, victory. It's very much divide and massacre. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like we, which has won battles time and time again. Parallels to battles like the Mopoli and similar battles. These are not stupid, ignorant mm. people who are just throwing themselves at the enemy. There's thought gone into this battle plan. Yes, exactly. And I mean like uh, the Scots like they had to use, you know, like they couldn't they could just rely on brute force because they would lose because the English outnumbered them two to one. So they have to come up with these tactics in order to defeat the English. And this this happens throughout Scottish history a lot. Where, you know, they're outnumbered and like they just have to try and like almost outwit the enemy. And one thing that played into the Scots' favour was probably like the arrogance of the commander as well. Like the English commander, like he just thought he was going to walk over the Scots because he knew he had a numerical advantage and that wasn't the case. The, the English being arrogant, never... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, certainly when it comes to scotland i mean who'd have thought <laughs> i know right <laughs> well thanks for that i'm gonna kind of direct mm. kyle now because i i know there's one thing that kyle and i have like frequently discussed and debated and it it, it is a basic pet peeve about braveheart that uh that, that kyle has so you you have a question regarding you know the uh the the most fictional concepts ever i believe the prima nocte yeah it's the driving th yeah. force of the main plot that the English noble basically wants to have his way with Wallace's wife before the wedding. And I've not been able to find any evidence that happened in Scotland, England, France, Germany, anywhere. And it's always been described as something that at least I've been able to find that other people do. Like, oh, we don't do that, but the people in the village across the road, they're, they're properly messed up. They do all this weird stuff. And then you go there, and they say, oh, no, we don't do that. It's the people in the valley next door that do that. Is there any actual evidence that you've been able to find that this took place anywhere, and especially, or especially in Scotland? No. I've not found anything about Prima Nocte in any way. And I mean, like, I've not heard about it in any other movie or, like, any historical document that i've ever read i've never heard of it so i don't know where the movie came up with this is it... do you think it was just possibly a a way of making edward the first just more evil yeah. i mean 
if you are starting with a Plantagenet king and you feel the need to make them more evil, you've got you've got something spectacularly wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those areas that just, you know, it, it's propaganda more than anything else, oh, I find. And, you know, the rest of the movie, have you got other examples of where things that are just, you know, painted as historical fact that are actually just, out, not just inaccurate, but outright propaganda and yeah, lie? Yeah, like, I mean... The, 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 there is a lot in the movie that does that. So, for example, I've already mentioned her, like Miram uh, Wallace's wife. That's all pure fiction. And it's propaganda because it looks like he was fighting for love and, you know, all of that nonsense, which mm. just wasn't the case. And there's also that romance with the French princess as well, which, you know, like the real, oh, yes. the, like the real person, the real princess was just a baby when Wallace was fighting the English. So, you know... Maybe we're missing something here. <laughs> like yeah. maybe Wallace. I don't understand it, it as well. Again, it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> yeah, like maybe Wallace yeah. was romancing babies. Who knows? <laughs> that escalated. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I understand, I mean, I'm not. It's my my area of medieval is Wars of the Roses. So I'm about kind of like a good hundred and fifty years later. But as I as I understand it, that by the time Queen Isabella actually came to England. And married Edward II. As I understand it, Wallace had been dead for three years by that point, hadn't he? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So he's, he was already dead by the time Edward II came along. And I mean, there is that element of, like, you know, Edward II looking gay in the movie as well. Mm. Now, I don't know if that's propaganda or not. That's something that I do not know. Like, I've heard rumours that Edward I actually did something to Edward II because he was gay. Like, he got a... Um, a hot iron rod and he stuck it somewhere not very pleasant <laughs> let's just say that like i did read that somewhere but i don't know if it's true like i really do not know mm. yeah and that sort of thing crops up quite a lot as well i mean i've never seen anything i've seen well i've seen lots of things to suggest edward the second sexuality but very little to actually evidence it yeah and that's what i found i mean like they did get that right in the sense that Edward II was pretty incompetent because, uh, you know, like Robert the Bruce leads a successful rebellion against the English when Edward II is in power. So, like, they do get that right because Edward II really struggled to fill his father's shoes after Edward I died. I mean, it's, it's good that you kind of bring up um, Robert the Bruce there, and I'd, I'd like to get. I'd like to get the opinion of a Scottish person on this one. Mm -hmm. um, quite, where I I asked this question at Stirling Castle and never got an answer from the tour guide that was there as well. And he's like, "Do you think a two hundred foot monument to a guy that basically won one major engagement was justified when the actual victor of Scottish independence, Robert the Bruce, gets a statue at Bannockburn? Uh, where Where do you sit with that?" Like. <sighs> In a way, it is. Like, it is justified in a way. Just because, um, like, Wallace was, like, he was the one who set up the foundation, which then, like, Bruce then took over and, you know, he led to success. Like, um, so, like, the thing is as well, like, with Robert the Bruce, he was a lot more politically cunning than Wallace in the sense that, you know, Bruce didn't, like, just stay with Wallace, and then he survived, and then he took over. Like, Bruce played both sides. So, like, if the English looked like they were going to win, Bruce would, like, go, oh, okay, I'm cosy with the English now. But then, like, when the Scots are going, like, looking like they're going to win, like, that's when Bruce, like, kind of cozies up with the Scottish nobles again. Um, so I think a lot of it comes from, you know, the, the fact that Wallace never swore fealty to the English, and the thing is, Bruce actually did, just to help his career. Which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. Like it's not a bad thing to do that. But I mean, heroes are more, you know, like they've got this like iron will almost. Like that's the way heroes are portrayed a lot of the time. And as well as that, Bruce built on a lot of Wallace's successes when he became King of Scotland in 1306. For example, he used the Shilton formations that Wallace first designed and used at the Battle of Falkirk. And it was these Shilton formations that helped Bruce win the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 as well. And Bruce uh, also learned lessons from Wallace when Wallace was fighting a guerrilla war against the English. So um, there's always that as well. So I think like a lot of people see it as Wallace started the journey and then Bruce finished it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it, and I can I can see the point there. That's the last question really from me is, um, and it's going to be more about the film than about the history. Okay. Um, 
but if, if you wanted to have a favourite war film, <laughs> being a Second World War nut myself, it's got to be Where Eagles Dare. <laughs> now, Where, Where Eagles Dare is a film so packed with anachronisms, mm. it should make me cry. <laughs> I mean, it's filled. It's like sixties haircuts. There's there's a helicopter in the castle courtyard. I mean, it's called a Bell Forty Seven for a very important reason. You know, it's very very much post war, and you know, the fact that Clint Eastwood can go through what is a thirty five minute gunfight without a single reload should <laughs> have my blood pressure cracking the ceiling, and yet it doesn't. And I speak to other historians, even some like leading academic historians who you ask them what their favorite war film is. Oh, where Eagles dare by an absolute mile. You get a similar sort of thing with like Kelly's heroes as well, with all its sixties hippie <laughs> drug smoking tank commanders uh, and so forth. And it's like, why does Braveheart get pilloried in the, hu- in the historical community and a film like we, where Eagles dare gets adored. Hmm. I, to be honest, I actually haven't seen Where Eagles Dare, so I can't really comment on it, unfortunately. <laughs> Although it's on oh, my. Oh, you need to change that in your life. I know, I really do. Like, like just the way that you described it, it, it sounds like the kind of movie that I really want to watch. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. But you, you know, you're gonna have something um, within kind of your love of uh, love of the ancient, the old, the sky. I mean, you know, things like I love a Knight's Tale. <laughs> yeah. Jousting is not like that, but oh my god, what such a great film! <laughs> yeah. yeah. But- like Troy, the Trojan War in the Iliad didn't happen anything like that film, but it's still a really good film. Yeah, <laughs> I actually agree with that uh, because, like, in the Iliad, isn't it like it's like a series? It's like ten years of war, right? So the Greeks like they go back and forward like every year, isn't it? As I understood the Iliad, the Iliad's like one month yeah. in the tenth year of the. Hmm. It's when all the exciting uh, bits happen, Trojan though. War. So Natalie Haynes tell yes. me I haven't read it's, the Iliad it, in years. It is, so. like, yeah, the bit where Hector uh, basically dies. But yeah, th- mm. it doesn't. Ha- the film doesn't happen like the book, but it's still an amazing film, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I really do love that film, actually. Um, it's 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 a classic movie for me to watch a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you think there's anything particular about the historian community that would like make them? They they would turn on Braveheart, but not necessarily turn on something like Troy or A Knight's Tale or Eagle's Dare. What is it about that film that riles everybody up? With Braveheart? I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Like, I really don't know. Like, I mean, Braveheart itself, um, like, because, like, I've, we all agree it's a great movie. It's just that historians seem to really dump on it for all of the inaccuracies. Uh, but like, th- there's just something that I really don't know why, because like I said, I enjoy it for entertainment. Like when I like watch these movies, that's what I try to do. It's more like mm. I take it with a pinch of salt and just enjoy the ride rather yeah. than, you know, like try and scrutinize it. I wonder, and you know, feel, feel free to comment. I wonder if it's the way that the film opens up with almost having a go at historians. <laughs> Because it, it does that, you know, and, and, and history is written by the those that have hanged heroes. And at which point, you know, any historian is going to go, no, no, history is written by people who've spent a lot of time in archives looking at facts. Thank you. <laughs> and it, it could be that. It could well be. And I mean, like, the opening sentence or like one of them, it, like, it's, it's straight up a lie because like it says... Like it, go, it talks about Malcolm Wallace, but then, uh, like when Robert the Bruce is narrating over, like the like the the opening scene, he calls Malcolm Wallace a commoner, which you know wasn't true. So you're just yeah. like, oh, there's strike two already. <laughs> they call Edward the First a cruel pagan as well. Sorry, I've I've, 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 I've just repeat yeah. that. Sorry, it was half yeah, right. They, yeah, they call Edward the First yeah. a cruel then, pagan, but he found out he was the king on the way back from a crusade. Yeah, I know, right? And that's the one thing as well. Like the movie does not mention anything about Edward the First actually going on a crusade. Hmm. Yeah, I mean that man was a pious warrior king. Whatever else he was, and they're they're a legion. Hmm. You know, you can't say he was a cruel pagan. You could say he was a cruel father. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you, you could say he was a cruel invader. Yeah. You can't say he's a cruel pagan. Yeah, because it's like fundamentally wrong. Yeah, uh, I mean, as well as that, like. It goes like again with that opening statement, like the movie makes. It then goes on to say that, um, you know, for his son, 
Edward the First chooses the daughter of the King of France. But then it meant it kind of hints towards the fact that Edward the First wanted her rather than having his son with her and things. You're like, this is weird. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's having some anachronisms in the background. Mm. Helicopters, <laughs> you know, slightly different clothes, costumes, you know, fantasy looking armor and then there's straight up lying to the camera and the audience i suppose that that could be where it comes from yeah it could yeah. be and i mean like the the dress code as well like i think i mean like it's weird because in scotland everyone loves the like the dress code for like all the scots and braveheart but i mean it, it's factually like it's not factual like they didn't dress like that and like you say as well, and we said earlier on, turning up to a battlefield in 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 a kilt, a shoulder throw, and a small shield, <laughs> you, you wouldn't you wouldn't even make it to, <laughs> you you wouldn't even be able to pick the pike up. The longbowman would have just taken you down straight away. Could, yeah. could I make a wild suggestion? Did the did the costume department put them in kilts to remind the audience that this is Scotland, and it's just visual shorthand? It could be actually, yeah, it could well be that. But I mean, like, surely, well, rem- mind you, like, the accents aren't exactly mm. the best either. So, yeah, mm. maybe it was something to do with that. And, like, they didn't even film the movie in Scotland, they filmed it in Ireland as well, yes. which is another blunder. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what looks just like Scotland? Yeah, so... Ireland! Apparently. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the Americans, like, when they're coming over, they're like, oh, Ireland, Scotland, the same thing, right? <laughs> That's probably what they're thinking. You know, they've got, they've both got some nice scenery. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you're American, what's not to like? Exactly, right? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dean. I mean, that was cathartic, to say the least, because, by God, I do enjoy a damn good Braveheart rant. So yeah. I've, I've got up this early this morning to do just that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to thank Dean for for appearing uh, on History Rage. Uh, I'm sure you would too. So, Dean, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, you're quite welcome. If you'd like to hear more from Dean on his specialist subject of ancient China, then his podcast, The Chronicler, is available on all good podcast platforms, as well as YouTube. Mm -hmm. And you can follow him on Twitter at The Chronicler H1. And we'll have links to all of those in the show notes. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can follow us on Twitter. I am at Paul Battle. And I'm at Kyle G History. And you can leave comments, thoughts, and please send your own History Rages using the hashtag History Rage. If you've enjoyed our work, then please subscribe. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks a lot for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.